Whiskey, and I'm uh, the executive director of the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation. We're based in, in New York City, and we are delighted to be part of this program tonight. I, um, and it's my, my privilege and honor to um, a bit, oh, get a little feedback. Officially uh, welcome, welcome you all to this event this evening. Documenting Newman's history is what exactly is in this film that you're about to see. Uh, 100, well, it's a girl is a fellow here, 100 women, uh, 100 women architects in the studio of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and it's educating the public, it's by bringing public conversations like this to public institutions uh, like the Detroit Institute of Art. And I also have to say, I don't think it's the first showing in Michigan, but it is certainly the first showing of this film here uh, at the, in Detroit. And you should also know that you've beat out by four days a premiere screening in London at the Royal Institute of Arch British Architects. So we're really pleased that this film, this little film, has traveled the world around. It's been premiered in Korea and Spain, uh, Ireland, now in, in London, so and now Detroit tonight. So, um, but the other thing about um, our foundation is that we collaborate with a lot of other organizations involved in in the, the built environment, whether historical, educational practice. So AIA in New York and around the country, but also with the Society of Architectural Historians. May I do a quick um, you know, a marketing thing? Who here in the audience, raise your hand if you are with, you know, a member of SAH? Hey, hot dog, all right, <laughs> super. Um, how many of you are practicing architects and with AIA Detroit? Raise your hand. Fabulous. Now, the and how many of you are none of the above, but just interested people who heard about this somehow and want to, you, way back there. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Um, well, that's fabulous, and that's exactly the kind of um, confluence of, of audiences that we want to bring together. Um, I should, full disclosure, I serve on the, the National Board of the Society of Architectural Historians, and uh, we're having our, as those of you with SH know, that we're here in Detroit because of our annual meeting, which travels to different cities around the country, and this year it's in Detroit, and it is breaking all records in terms of attendance and activities and so forth, and this is just one of the sort of ancillary events that are occurring around it. So I thought this was an opportunity to bring our foundation and our mission, uh, working with SAH, which is, if you all, I hope, got your flyers, and you'll see all the multiple um, sponsors of this event, but the Society of Architectural Historians is also a sponsor of this event, as is our uh, EWAF. And I just want to, uh, one of our party favors that we developed is the Women Rulers of Architecture. Uh, because all the, uh, there's a whole series, and the one that's the uh, you know, rulers of architecture, it's all men, and the image is uh, Corbusier at the top. Here is Louise Bethune. Next year in Buffalo, um, because she hailed from Buffalo, you'll be hearing a lot about Bethune. So I have a couple of these, and, and there may be a quiz at the end, um, and whoever wins you know, all the questions will, will get one of these. Um, so I'm thrilled to, to be here. I am also, I, I guess, yes, it's also um, my responsibility to just mention in terms of SAH. I did um, encourage and uh, was lucky to get a yes from one of our panelists, Cynthia Weiss, uh, who is also serves on the board of SAH. So we are, we, we are delighted to be collaborating in a, such a meaningful way tonight with, with Detroit on so many levels. And one other announcement is that in your program, um, it states that Beverly Willis, who is the chair and founder of our foundation, Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation, was regrettably unable to attend tonight. She did not make the trip to Detroit. So I'll be sort of filling in. I've been involved in every aspect of the foundation and the making of the film and the issues at hand. So I will uh, just pretend I'm about a foot shorter, a little bit wider, and have big poofed white hair, and um, I'll be Beverly. So with that, I just want to introduce Ashley Flintoff, who is my um, the, the real instigator of this evening. Not have happened without the the support and the help of our sponsors. 
Um, first and foremost, AIA Detroit, which is putting the whole thing on. Um, obviously, the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation and the Society for Architectural Historians. Uh, I want to thank the DIA for providing a beautiful venue, as always. Um, they're wonderful to work with, and if you haven't had a chance, please come back, check out our world-class collection here at the DIA. Um, I want to thank Smith Group JJR, American Interiors, the University of Detroit Mercy School of Architecture, Rossetti FX Architecture, Cynthia K. Pozzolo, AIA Lead AP, and also 14 East, Kimball Office, and DL Couch for sponsoring our Afterglow. And also I would like to thank our videographer, Alex Hancock, who is over there in the corner. Um, we will be recording the panel discussion and then it will be up online um, on the AIA Detroit website and maybe elsewhere, hopefully, so that you can view it again and your friends who sadly were not able to make it will be able to see it as well. So with that, I would like to turn to the film and we'll go from there. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone again for, for coming and um, we're going to kind of approach this. I have some sample questions, but I, I really want us to open this up as a dialogue. So if anyone has a question or would like to, you know, comment, please feel free. I, I really want it to be a conversation about design and about women and, and, and where we're going in the industry. Um, again, I just want to... Uh, Welcome our panelists. Um, we have Wanda Buriski, who is the executive director of the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation. Next to her is Cynthia Weiss, FAIA of Weiss Langley Weiss in Chicago. And then we have Tracy Sweeney, who is um, AIA, sorry, and lead AP. And she's with Fanning Howie here in Metro Detroit. And then on the end, we have Naomi Beasley, who is a graduate student of the University of Detroit Mercy School of Architecture. She's AIAS and NOMAS. So I just want to thank them all for uh, participating tonight. And please, like I said, feel free to join in the conversation. So I just wanted to give a little bit of background as to why women in design in Detroit, why am I standing up here, why did we even do any of this? And, you know, Detroit has a very rich history of design, innovation, and really strong women leaders, not just in design, but in, in many different industries. Um, just Rosa Parks, Grace Lee Boggs, Ruth Adler Schnee, Florence Knoll, Ray Eames, the list goes on, and that's just the historical. It's not even mentioning all the fabulous women we have practicing um, in industries across, across the, the metro D Detroit area. Um, so I really just wanted to celebrate kind of our history and, and see how we can move women in design forward and really encourage more diversity and inclusion of everybody across the board in, in, the, in the field. Um, the number of women in architecture has declined in some areas recently and I think now is the perfect time to start to open the dialogue and, and really encourage women and minorities to not only enter the profession, but those who are already in the profession, we need to encourage them to succeed and to, to push our industry forward. So um, we have bios in the program, so I'm not gonna do the whole, read through the whole thing, but I just wanted to have the panelists do a, a little introduction, but as your introduction, I, I want to know, what was your inspiration for the design field? Who, who, ins who or what inspired you and why are, why are you here? <laughs> person who's been in here the longest, maybe I can, <laughs> maybe I would, I would start. Um, you know, I decided when I was 14 that I wanted to be an architect, and uh, at the time I thought it was because I loved to draw, which I still do, and uh, that I liked math and physics, and that was a logical combination. Though much later I realized that in my life uh, there were certain places that had been terribly important to me and had... Um, I can still see them. I can still see these buildings, these places. Uh, one was my grandmother's house, which uh, I realized much later was a craftsman house, uh, and I visited her a lot. Uh, I'm from Iowa. She lived in Des Moines. And the, another was the um, Des Moines Art Center, which was done by Aliel Saarinen in the late, uh, mid to late 40s. And I remember taking my grandmother around to the back. It's a U-shaped building, or was around a court, courtyard, and I remember dragging my grandmother through the 
construction mud and uh, <laughs> she had to wipe it off her shoes. The other, the, the other one that I can still see, it was a hot day. We were driving back from, uh, from Wisconsin on a vacation. We stopped at a gas station long before air conditioning in cars. And I looked up, as we were seeing Wisconsin, and I saw the Johnson's Wax Tower. And I had never seen anything like that before. But I think these things really stayed with me and formed a kind of, um, not only uh, uh, buildings, but uh, they were part of a, a culture. They, they transcended uh, a culture. And I, they were terribly important to me. And then I went to school at Washington University in St. Louis where the faculty were quite young, they had professional lives, and I was treated very fairly and very well long before the feminist movement. And it was really, uh, that was sort of what started me on my path. Excellent, thank you. I don't think I can quite compete with that. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of, um, Count my being here as a beautiful, happy accident. That's how I tell people, and I guess there are really no accidents. When I was in high school, I had the good fortune to be able to go to Ball State for two weeks in the summer and do what was basically a summer program in architecture. At the time, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I really enjoyed drawing and art and you know, math and science, as a lot of women who go into architecture say that that's kind of where they get their start. But we did the program. We went to Columbus, Indiana, and everybody kind of knows what you find there. And it was, anybody that knows me knows that I'm not speechless very often. <laughs> and that, that trip was just eye-opening. I, I was speechless while we were on the trip, and when I came back, I just couldn't stop talking about it. And, uh, you know, we were there, we were doing all the studio stuff that you actually do in school. I'm explaining it to everybody and saying, it's great, we were doing these creative projects, we were solving these problems, we were staying up all night. And, you could tell who was really interested because some people just said, why would that be interesting to you? <laughs> why would that capture your attention? But from that time on, I was just kind of hooked. So I went to Lawrence Tech here, which was a wonderful experience for me, a very close-knit community. Um, I was one of the guys there, and I thought that that was, that was good. You know, I, I felt like I fit in, and everything kind of just worked out from there. So I've been with Fannie Mae for 11 years, and it's another kind of family experience for me. Um, well, I'm Naomi and I'm a native Detroiter and um, I guess I've always known that I want to do architecture. Uh, I remember being little and every Saturday I spent it with my dad and we would go downtown and we always went to the art supply store in Utrecht and when it was right on Woodward and Warren at the time. And um, we would always walk around downtown and even at that time downtown wasn't a pleasant place to be. but. It always interests me just to see these tall buildings we would walk through downtown, just, just to have something to do. And as I got older and I could read more, every weekend we went to uh, Builder Square at the time, I guess. <laughs> and um, every weekend I would, or every other weekend, I would get a floor plan book. And, and I remember being in seventh grade and having graph paper for math, but instead drawing little floor plans. And, um, and so I've always taken an interest in how things are put together. And, um, and also in going to U of D where there's a, um, the dynamic of U of D is very interesting. It's very great that you have people from all over Michigan that come to an urban context to study architecture and how to, to observe how others put things together in their mind and how it all relates to one thing. Um, and so I've enjoyed my, Five years, five years of studies there. I confess I am not an architect. I don't have my degree in architecture, but in architectural history. So I'm just going to do a quick pitch for um, the study of architectural history. Um, no one mentioned a person, like a specific mentor that, that inspired them, and I should just say, Mine was my mother, and she loved architecture, and she took us all over wherever, New York, and I grew up in a big old Victorian house, so realized, you know, um, amazed by spaces and materials, and I think two pivotal moments were going to the New York World's Fair in 1964, 
so it dates me, okay. And then <laughs> to, uh, uh, but then up to Montreal to the um, Expo in Montreal in 1967, and I think it was just these, these, and those two were very visionary buildings and so forth, and that was like, oh, wow. But, so I didn't practice architecture, I did not, I was not drawn to the making of it, but to the studying of it, and to the studying of spaces, and to the studying of cities. And so that's what's drawn me to, you know, I'm charter member, not charter member, but a long time member of the Society of Architectural Historians. And I just want to make a pitch for those of you as architects and historians that for the world of, that, that you do have, it's not just working in firms, but the world of nonprofits these days, especially, is a very viable one. And there are multiple kinds of organizations and um, associations where our work is very important. Obviously, my work with BWAF, but in New York alone, there's the Design Trust, there's Van Allen Institute, there's the Storefront for Art and Architecture. There are all, multiple museums and so forth. So um, keep that in mind as well for those of you that are students or considering uh, possible venture into the world of architecture, but not necessarily as an architect. I'll just, I'll, I'll throw in my pitch. I got started with Lincoln Logs, so clearly I had the Frank Lloyd Wright connection, but it was really my great aunt Florence who gave me the Lincoln Logs and just really encouraged me. And she, she was also a lover of Detroit, so I think that's how I kind of ended up in architecture and in Detroit, all from her. Um, so for me, it was it was just the, the tangible taking pieces and, and making something out of them, and I just I think it's really inspiring to to hear how people got into the field because you find connections and you find stories that and it's not that's always different. It's never the same. So I think that's a really rich part of sharing our history. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, the film touched on a lack of women history um, in architecture. And I just wondered um, how that relates to you and how that relates to how you practice in architecture. I know talking to Naomi before the event, she had said, you know, I never knew all of this stuff. I didn't know about all of these women. Why didn't I know about them? So I think it's an important question and I was just thought we'd, we'd chat a little bit about how that, how that relates to you and why you think that that there's a need to have this history documented. I think it's very important to recognize women's contributions, um, and I think the film is marvelous. I've, this is the second time I've seen it, and I really appreciate it. I think it's a wonderful thing, and um, I think there are many ways that uh, we need to uh, recognize uh, recognize women. When uh, I can tell a story about Chicago, uh, many years ago there were two shows of architecture that uh, on, on the history of Chicago architecture. One was the Miesian part of Chicago, and in sort of uh, contradiction to that or you know, uh, opposition to that, uh, a group of uh, architects or organized um, uh, another show about uh, archi other, other architects who weren't Miesian in <laughs> Chicago who had been very important. And it opened, the two shows opened the same night there was not a single woman in either show. And I had a, uh, a friend and client, who, a woman artist, and I, she was having an opening of her, at her gallery that same night. So I basically went to that opening <laughs> and complained. And uh, she called me up and said, well, okay, if you help us with our new gallery space, you will have a show on women in architecture. And it was, a, it was revelatory. These things are revelatory. Um, I started calling women up in the spring, it was going to be the next January, and they said, oh no, I couldn't possibly do it. I don't have anything photographed, I don't have anything, I wasn't really the designer, uh, I just built the model, and I said, well that's fine, you know, we'll just say you built the model, then we'll show your model, or whatever. And one woman did, um, she said, I just read line drawings, and I said, that's great, that would be wonderful to include. So, uh, throughout the course of this, uh, women understood that they, they, they had made contributions in many, many ways, many layers of, uh, of ways and meanings, and it was very touching to see. So I think um, we just have to keep doing this. We have to keep uh, writing the history, and now the history of women, I, I feel really good looking ahead, that there's so many strong women in the field, 
who are doing marvelous work and being recognized at this time for their really, really good work. Can I just went to, to speak to the movie and just a little bit of the backstory. If Beverly were here, she'd be, you know, making sure you hear it. Um, that, that, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright is an icon, right, of American architecture. Uh, you could probably fill this room with the, um, the documentation and the writings about Frank Lloyd Wright. And it took, um, you know, our foundation and Beverly Willis, uh, you know, an 80-year-old architect at the time, to write and direct this, this film. And it was uncovering material that existed, but no one, out of a mountain of material, second, you know, the secondary sources, no one ever bothered to ask the question, you know, and to, and, and all the references uh, to Mary Mahoney, to Isabel Roberts, often, you know, Bev said, I have to go to the footnotes. They're all footnotes. They're all footnotes to history. And I think that, that it, it, it takes conversations like this and a film like this to just underscore um, that the primary resources or the primary, if we look at the primary sources, the materials there, the contributions are, are eminently evident, but it's then, and this is USAH people, this is our job is in, in the writing of these historical narratives is to be conscious. And I'm not saying it's like intentional to leave women out, but we just have these internal biases that we, you know, decide what's, we sort of censor out what we think is important and is not. And so that is, eminently important to all of us to be just really conscious of, um, you know, the stories that are out there, the contributions. Start in the education and in the curriculums that the schools are writing for the students that, granted, there may be a majority of male students in the audience, but that they too need to be educated about the contributions that women have made. And I think that that would make a difference in the dynamic that you have in your studios, the respect that you do or you may or may not get in your studios being a female in a male-dominated studio. And so I think that it has to start at the collegiate level to educate everyone, all architecture students, about the role that women have had in history. A film like this kind of makes at least me stop and think about my place in a bigger piece, and it's not something that we do very often. There seems to be this great myth that we're doing something that not many people do. I mean, I'll tell people that I'm an architect, and oh, well, were you the only girl in your class, or you know, how did that work? Or you go to a conference, and they say, oh, you're a expert because you do marketing. And that's, that's not what I do. I'm, you know, somebody actually came by the booth one time and said, oh, so you're the booth babe. <laughs> yeah, so that's not on my business card, that is not one of my job descriptions. Um, I think what I've noticed other women in the profession is that we tend to underemphasize what it is that we do. And I think you touched on it when you said, well, I don't really have anything ready, I don't have photos, I, I'm not ready to show this, and for whatever reason, what we're doing is so important to us. What we're doing is a part of who we are, but at the same time, we're not the ones that will tend to stand out there and promote that. So even you know, when you look at yourself or you look at the other women that you've worked with or you've gone through school with, there's a great many more of them, I think, than people you know, kind of suppose, but maybe we're not standing up and making sure people know what we do. Right. Well, maybe that speaks to the, the importance of the if you as women architects have a, and this is, this is why we're, our foundation is doing what we're doing and doing films like this and conversations like this, is to let you know that there is a tradition. There is a very long tradition of women practitioners <clears throat> in, you know, in the United States and throughout the world. And I guess the question would be, um, so you know you have a legacy, you have your own legacy, um, I would just be interested to know, just down the line, Naomi, who was the first woman architect that, you know, historically that you've, you ever heard about? Um, Tonight? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> the first woman architect that, name that I heard and that's very common is Zaha Hadid. She's the first woman architect that I had heard of. Um, and to hear of all of these other women. Yes, today was the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, let me, okay, um, the first woman architect that is no longer alive. So you're not Tracy? Well, actually, I, I do have an answer for that. Marion Mahoney, is, uh, uh, that was the one that I knew, and it, w it wasn't because I knew of her in her own right. It started out being, um, just being enraptured by the drawings that were associated with Wright, and then that kind of moment of inspiration when at one point somebody said, well, you realize those aren't his drawings, right? <laughs> you know, he didn't really do those. And then you start to look at everyone that was involved in that effort. And that's when I kind of came to the realization and you know, saw for the first time what the involvement was there. I would say Mary Mahoney as well. Uh, also, uh, uh, Sophie Hayden, who was the first woman graduate of uh, architecture school in the United States and who uh, did the woman's building uh, at the um, Fair of 93. Uh, she was, uh, I mean, that, was, that would be an inspiration. And then there were women, um, women were not allowed into Harvard. Uh, and they founded a whole school called the Cambridge School, uh, where which was for women in Cambridge because they couldn't go to Harvard. But you know, World War II came along, and um, all of a sudden, Harvard, being empty of men, decided that they could take women. So I know. <laughs> what a surprise! Yeah, what a surprise! So I know, uh, I know, I know several women who went through. Uh, went to Harvard and uh, or went to architecture school during during the Second World War and who emerged and uh, worked uh, specifically in Chicago. But they were uh, they were important, I think, to uh, to women architects in Chicago. Both of them, there are two of them: uh, uh, Gertrude Curtis and Natalie Bloy. And uh, Gertrude uh, founded was the the spirit, the guiding spirit behind the founding of Chicago Women. They were very strong women. They came out of architecture school and went into practice and in large firms, in Stigma, Rawlings, and Merrill, just as all men uh, uh, came back from the war. And they had a very, uh, they, had, they are very strong people having survived that. Just a quick correction, because I'm the historian. Natalie Dubois went to Columbia University. Oh, Gert went to Columbia. Right, right. And, and Columbia, Columbia, same story, <laughs> same story. <laughs> Vacancies, the women could come in as soon as the men ca came back. The women were all booted out of the, you know, out of the, their seat. Anyway, th that's <laughs> details. <No. laughs> well, touching upon that, I mean, we, we the film touched on some challenges, and we've already mentioned past. And I'm just curious how these relate to challenges that you see happening today. And then also, as the industry evolves, and as we encourage, hopefully, more women to succeed in the industry, how do you see these, this changing, these challenges changing, and what can we do you know, beyond just say, beyond writing the history, are there other things that we can do to encourage these changes and, and kind of mitigate some of the challenges that, that we see occurring today? Okay. <laughs> um, I think my experience with women in architecture has been that we just decide that this is what we're gonna do and we make it happen. So there's less acknowledgement of the challenges that get you there. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing people try to correct at this point is that there's some well-meaning advice that's given by senior architects and firms, mostly men, and it's based on their own experience or based on the experience of their contemporaries. Things like, when you start out, jump from firm to firm to firm because that's how you get the experience and that's how you increase your salary. And I stopped one of the senior partners in my firm once when he was giving this advice to somebody and I said, just think about that before you give that advice to all your interns. Because if you think about young women as they get into the profession, um, there is also some value to the idea of maybe you wanna plant some roots and stay for a while because if you are starting a family that has a different impact on women and their career and kind of where they're going from that point. So sometimes you don't want to be the last one in when other family events and other life events kind of come along. So that's not the only piece of advice that I've run across over the years that has kind of a particular slant. And people don't even stop to think about, think about it. It wasn't a, an ill-meant piece of advice. It was just based on experience. So I think 
in order to correct some of these things, it's, it's more thinking about what those experiences mean to different people who are in different places in their lives. And it's not just women. Um, everybody had their own particular situation. So really looking at those well-meaning pieces of advice is something that I think we don't do often enough. Um, well, I would say that sometimes you don't really notice that you're the only woman in the room. Um, well, more so particularly with the dynamic at U of D Mercy because we're a smaller school and everyone is, uh, it's more personal there. So you don't really acknowledge that you're the only woman or that you're the only minority. Um, so it's more so when you leave uh, your safety net or your comfort zone that you realize I'm the minority in the room, I'm the only one or, um, and so, um, I think a, kind of what you said, it's, it's situational and circumstantial, and it's based on your experience. Um, but we often overlook the realities of the, the facing, the issues that women still face in architecture because we are, we're technically accepted or we're technically considered to be equal. And so uh, I think that plays a part in it, but, um, pardon, <laughs> finals brain. <laughs> um, I saw a whole bunch of people out there that have been through it and died. going to, to uh, help me or is it not? And to not to put yourself in a situation where you're sort of banging your head against the wall and, uh, and doing, uh, doing something that, that you're really going to have trouble. I think the important thing is to focus on, um, as architects, uh, as women in the field, to focus on the work that you do and do it as, as well as you can. And uh, to, you know, that's the most important thing that you can do. That's, that's my position, that the most important thing you can do is to do your work well and to move, move ahead and move other people and help other people uh, uh, move ahead. Uh, so I think it does, I think it does uh, uh, hinge on your choices. And a school is probably the first most important cho or one of the most important choices that you can make. Where, so you go to a school uh, where they value you as much as you value the uh, the education that you get there, and you know that you're going to be that you're going to be valued. It was terribly important for me long, long ago. Uh, may I just ask a new question? Of the, um, since each of you have gone through architecture school, um, did the schooling itself address at all um, an issue of? It, you know your future practice and what some what uh, how to greet that and and was it at all uh, gender based and I ask this just because the um, the recent um, meeting of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture there's a Women's Leadership Council our foundation was was um, helped catalyst in, in, in forming that and there was deep discussion about curricula and um, best practices and um, you know, having a gender component in, in, in the curricula. And I was just wondering if in your own um, experience, in your own educational background, that any of this was addressed at the time that you were a student, or in the case of Cynthia, Dean of Washington University. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, any specifics? Not that I can recall, again, because of the structure of U of D, um, specifically, it's not, gender doesn't really become prevalent in the curricula or in, um, like I said, it's not really until you step outside of those four walls that you wouldn't, that it becomes um, known to you or that you recognize those things. Um, 
So, and because we're all treated as equals in, in the job search and, and the curriculum and when it comes to grading and those type of things that um, I would say that um, I have, uh, I cannot recall. Mm -hmm. I don't remember gender ever being addressed specifically. I think I would get some agreement in the room that there's a, a great number of things that they say, well, they didn't teach you about this in school. Let me tell you, when you're out in the real world, this is how it's going to be. I think indirectly, non-curricular um, paths were taken to address some of the things we face gender-wise. I remember one of my first studio classes, there was a particular professor, and I'm not going to describe him too much because some more tech graduates might know who it was. <laughs> but it was a introductory kind of visual communication del uh, delineation type class, and it was well, we're gonna do plan views, and let me demonstrate how to do the plan views. So here's the site plan, and here's the pool, and here's the girl next to the pool in her bikini, and you know, those sorts of things, and it was just, it kind of numbed you to it. You kind of got used to it, and it, it didn't seem really like that big of a deal anymore. So some of those things, I think it wasn't intended to be part of the curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> But I would say in some ways, just the experience of being in school and getting used to what you said, getting used to being the girl in the room until it didn't feel unusual to you anymore. It wasn't intended to be part of the curriculum, but I think in some ways prepared us for what we faced. Well, I, I'm thinking back to, to, to school time, and, and as I said, um, I was encouraged to come to this school by the dean who was a, um, uh, a young, uh, graduate whose wife was a biophysicist, and he, and he said to me uh, when I first met him, uh, we need more women here, which they certainly did. I was the only woman in the class. And actually, that was, that was not bad for me. It was good because I got I mean, at 18 years old, a shy person from Iowa. Um, it was good for me to, to uh, work and, and uh, work together, compete with uh, other, with men my age young men my age, and we, they were kind of like brothers. Um, and I never heard anything like that. It was unusual, because I think it was, it, uh, it's still endemic. So when I became dean, uh, my real concern was to get more women into the school uh, as faculty members. Um, and I worked hard at doing that. And there were, when I came to the school, it was something like 30 or 35% women, also to get more women students. And when I left, it was close to 50%, and the freshman class was about 65% women. I think just by, by, by attitude, an attitude of, uh, uh, and of course I was the, the dean, so if they, if they couldn't take a woman, they, they wouldn't come. But, um, I, I think it's, it, it's very important that you set a kind of uh, measure of a, uh, of a culture that is acceptable uh, in, in, a, in a school, and I think that's the most, that's the very beginning of it. And then, uh, and architects, another thing that's really important in school is that you recognize and uh, support leadership in students, women students, men students, everybody. Uh, because architects, uh, at some point in their careers, um, are the only, you know, the architect is the only person at one point in the building process or the con conceptual <laughs> process who really understands how marvelous this is going to be in the end when it gets built. And uh, they lead and bring everybody with them and they lead. And I think it's very important um, that students, men and women alike, uh, are made aware of that and helped to, uh, help to overcome uh, the kinds of hurdles that you're talking about uh, as your leaders uh, in, the, in, in the building process, which means you also have to con confront sexism directly. Well, kind of a redirect based on your comment. Uh, the culture is so important. I don't remember feeling that very much from the male students, and maybe it's a generational kind of thing. Yeah. I, I, I don't really recall that. I remember the camaraderie. I remember the studio time. I don't remember that being a huge problem. I also remember a great deal of support from some of the other professors, and I think the lesson that came out of that was what you were doing was as good or better than what anybody else was doing. So you were carrying that forward with you as well. well to add to that, when I had, I met, I 
meant amongst students. But now that I don't think about it, it happens with male students and looking to having women professors. Um, that has, and some of your comments made me recall instances where if a female professor came down too hard on a male student, that it would be a problem, or that you know they would have some kind of negative remark about what she has to say, or well, she's just a woman, or say derogatory terms about her being a woman and being a professor. And so I, it, I think it is generational, but it's not really amongst the students. It's more so the students and the uh, the professors. So. Um, and I don't know, maybe that dynamic is different in other schools, but it's happened a few times now that I can recall. And sometimes you just want to look at that person and say, no, you need to step it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, you know, right. right. You there's, to step there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, <laughs> there's a great deal to be said for, for um, directly confronting uh, issues like that. I mean, because first of all, it would take everybody by surprise. They, won't, they would be surprised. And it, uh, they're, they're speechless. Yeah. But I think also, um, in terms of, I've watched uh, women architects understand uh, their role and understand uh, how important uh, they are, uh, kind of come to discover in some cases how important they are in the process. Um, and I think, it, it, you know, at, at one point it was seen as uh, if you work within the profession, you aren't changing the profession, that you need to be outside it and kind of be critiquing it and so on. And I really do think that people as um, accomplished and bright as these two young women uh, are uh, just marvelous contributors to the profession and, and we have to, we always have to think about moving ahead together. Uh, architecture is the most collaborative of all the arts and you, we, we have to work uh, across genders, across every uh, everything, and we, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, equip ourselves to do, to be able to do that, and we need to do it. You guys have all the capabilities of doing it, and I'm sure you are. <laughs> You actually just answered my, my next question, <laughs> which was, you know, just how we can encourage more young women to enter the field and then those that are in the field, assist them in succeeding. And I know for me, a lot of it was I was lucky enough, or I've been lucky enough to have um, a couple really strong mentors. One was male and one was female. Um, and both of them kind of took me under their wing and said, you know, we believe that you can do this, and so here are the tools, and here are some suggestions, and 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 they were a little bit nicer than the suggestion of you know jump around a lot. <laughs> but um, I think also what helped is uh, I'm a graduate of, of U of D as well, and for me when I was in school there were quite a few female professors, and and I think that helped. Um, I think it helped see women in these roles and and really. It was encouraging to say, you know, I can do this, and, and Naomi, I didn't realize that I was there, so <laughs> there's something to be said for that, too. But I think, you know, my next question would just be, you know, what do you feel is, is encouraging to young women? What encouraged you, and, and how can we encourage and, and support the women and, and the minorities in the field to, to continue on and to, to spread beyond what we have today? Well, I, um, I just, it, it sounds like a great, um, a great situation, and then I would just have to counter that, why is it that the approximate percentage of women members of the AIA, you know, hover between 15 and 17 percent? So, you know, if we're getting all this encouragement in the schools, and, and, and we have all the brains and talent and, and, uh, and the tools and, and so forth, why is it that the actual, once you get into the profession, there, there does seem to be this tremendous attrition rate? Um, so that, I, so I might want to just, uh, yeah. So I, I, I think that there's, there are still some very strong challenges um, out there. And I think that to counter it, it, it's probably, as we're trying to do is change the building industry, just in project delivery. And, and the hours that, that, that an architect on average works, what, 12 hours a day? 
that that's not um, that that's I do that. That but might I'm, be a short know, day. That's, that's, a, that's <laughs> been looking at my time card. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that we can do in terms of encouraging young girls to come into the profession is there seems to be a great misunderstanding about what it is that we do on a day to day basis. If you ask most people what an architect does, they know it has something to do with drawings and buildings, and, and that's about it. There's a great deal of therapy that we do. <laughs> we, we help people, we talk to people, we understand problems. There's a lot of interpersonal skill that's involved in what we do in project management, in, in making people get along with other people. And if you look at the science, those are some of the things that women excel at. And I think if they had a little bit better understanding that it wasn't so much about, oh, there's a lot of math in architecture. I don't think there's really that much math. I don't remember it being that insurmountable. So maybe part of it is a messaging issue that we really need to, to tell people, you know, this is what I do during my day, and maybe only this much of it is spent doing the, the artistic drawing stuff and, there's a lot of time spent on the phone, and a lot of time holding hands, and a lot of time visiting clients and assuring them that don't worry, wait a couple more weeks because it really is going to look like what we talked about. And like I said, I think those are the things, those are the strengths that women bring to the teams. And I think if you look at successful teams in architecture, you can have a successful team of all women. You can have a successful team of all men. Some of the most successful teams that I've seen are a a combination of those two, because the problem solving styles and the approaches and the interpersonal skills. And we've been to meetings where I'll go with a male colleague, and I would swear when we walked out of the meeting, we went to two different meetings. People <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, say, that was a great meeting, and I said, what meeting did you go to? <laughs> if, you were watching, if you were watching that one in the corner, or this one over here, did you see how these two were talking, or did you, you know, they said this, but you know they didn't really mean this. I think women maybe are just a little bit more tuned to that. So to me, it's, you're right. it's an issue of talking about the strengths that each gender brings to the team and how that plays into the work that we really do as opposed to the work that the movies say that <laughs> architects do, which really isn't much. <laughs> Tracy, you put your finger right on the, all the current research in sociology, psychology, and uh, economics say exactly that, that the key to innovation, uh, I think it was a London School of Economics uh, publication around 2008, 2009, underscored that, that specifically to not just architecture, but applied to architecture as well, um, that the best teams that will create the most innovative um, uh, solutions involve uh, equal 50-50, 40-60, but male-female for exactly that. And you also raise another really good point, is that there are, um, there, there, there is a, a gendered way that we um, think and we uh, speak. And communication is one of them. Um, another fabulous book that I highly recommend to all of you, it's called The Female Vision. Um, and it's the author Sally Helgeson and uh, Julie something or other. But it's, it's exactly that. It's looking at all these top CEOs in the, in the country and how their vision uh, for running these firms and dealing with this, uh, not a glass ceiling, but as Toshika Moran calls it, a thick uh, level of men, um, that these, these ideas just wouldn't be going in there. And so I think that that's, I guess that was sort of the point I was trying to make, that there are certain tools that we all have to be very cognizant of, I mean, male and female alike, about these sort of um, uh, different ways of, of hearing and communicating. And, um, uh, and I think that maybe one, uh, you know, move for the, the profession is just to embrace at all levels of practice, whether a small firm or these large firms like AECOM with 52,000 globally around the world, um, that, that you have to embrace the idea that men and women both need to um, be working together and that you're going you're gonna to have a better product, you're going to have a better project. Um, and I think also to have women represented in, in firms at, when you go to, you know, a project uh, and your firm is up, you know, one of the, the finalists for, let's say, uh, 
anything from a school to a museum to uh, a subway system to an airport. Um, these days, the patrons, especially in healthcare and in the public sector, the jury, so to speak, the clients, they're going to be, if not, um, there's going to be women on those juries, on those uh, client teams. And they're, they, 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 they want to see a Tracy, they want to see a Cynthia, you know, they, they want to see women have a meaningful peace and, and place in, in these projects. And that's, that's a very good point. I've, I've been um, an advisor to several groups uh, who were choosing architects, and one uh, was for the St. Louis, Art, uh, the St. Louis Art Museum. And uh, they noticed. They noticed that there were women there, but the women didn't say anything. They noticed when the women participated. It was a, it's a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, a very, uh, a very important thing. And I think that the idea of teamwork uh, in an architecture practice is much more prevalent now than it was, for instance, when I probably started to practice. But I practiced on my own, and then, um, then I, and my husband and I started practicing together. Uh, but I think the idea of teams of people and uh, is, is is just much more prevalent in in the 50s and 60s. It would be the architect, and then there was a project manager, and then there was the general captain, and then there were the draftsmen, and so on. So it was very very hierarchical. And I think that that's uh, that's another structure that certainly could be a way to engage uh, engage and break down the barriers. Uh, I think it already is. But, um, but probably needs to do it more. In my practice, I find being a woman in advantage to do a lot of public library work, and the directors, mm -hmm. by and large, are women. Oh, mm -hmm. And when we're sitting in the room and I'm there with my mentor that I've worked with for 10 years, he's considerably older than me with the requisite gray hair. So in those meetings where that is needed, that's the role that he fills. But in those times when we have to do the, the examination of the buildings and try to find out what's wrong, I know that my role is to go check out the youth department because I don't have the creepy factor. They just give them the look, but I can go without anybody even questioning when I'm doing it. So there, there are some advantages. I think. <laughs> okay, and then just finally, and then I want to open it up for any questions or. You know, as we as we look towards the next generation of women in architecture, of women in design, you know, what 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 would you like to tell them? What what do you want to be your legacy to this new generation as they they come forward and, and push even more boundaries than, they, than we have? <laughs> oh, I think they already have pushed so many boundaries. It's wonderful. I I think there's so much hope and so much. Uh, uh, excitement! Uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to uh, to know uh, uh, young young women architects all over the country. Um, I I guess my my uh, uh, advice would be just chart your course wisely and think of the, the places, think of the uh, uh, the uh, the um, firms, uh, think of the school, think of the firms, think of the way you you conduct your life, and also, I think it's extraordinarily important to do the things that you believe in, and to work for clients that you believe in, whose values you share. Life is too short not to do that, so I guess that would be my advice. Um, I asked me at the beginning, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm transitioning, but I think that one piece of, of advice that I would pass on would be, um, to pursue it in spite of the circumstances that you were given. Um, I have found in talking with a lot of young, younger people through mentoring programs and such that they make a lot of excuses as to why, why not, why can't I, why can't you? Um, and so um, it's one piece of advice that I would give would be just to not be afraid to step out on a limb and to do it because so many other people have paved the way for you to do it. And so what can you do? And one question that I found myself asking a lot of you that I work with is, you know, well, you want to, you know, make a name for yourself, but, you know, you have to also uh, pay homage to those that went ahead of you, that have paved the way for you. And so, uh, you know, just 
asking them, you know, well, what do you see yourself doing that creates a new legacy? And so, uh, again, just that you can do anything that you put your mind to, right? Um, yeah. Things can kind of feel so daunting at times. You know, you look at it, and I think one of the greatest pieces of advice that somebody gave me, and they didn't intend for it to be advice, was we were working on something, and I was, I was looking at how to do a part of the proposal, and I just, I didn't feel like I had the experience to do it. I didn't know what to do, and, and the guy I was working with said, well, I didn't know either. I kind of just made it up. <laughs> but that was a revelation to me, because I looked at him every day, and I just thought he knew everything. And so I guess my advice is, don't be afraid. Trust yourself. Find yeah. your voice and say it out loud and live large and and do exactly what it is that you feel that it's important to do. You know, none other than the Dalai Lama said the Western woman was going to save the world. So if we can save the world, I can't. I can't. I can't top the Dalai Lama. <laughs> BWAF.org and we'll, we'll feed you whatever you need and we'll just tape this conversation and we'll... <laughs> I would just open it up to anyone in the audience. on her own. She doesn't have to take the guff from the principal's <laughs> partners. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but and I, I know that um, uh, Cynthia mentioned Natalie Dubois, who worked at SOM, and there were a whole um, number of women that worked at SOM, but they never made it up to partner. Right now, or I guess it's a partner, that's a partner. Sorry, partner, principal is a corporate form. Yeah. But but not not now. And we did a, we showed the film at the SOM office in New York back in November, and the and the and it was at the behest of the young the youngest women in the office. And um, yeah, it was great. And they did this really incriminating PowerPoint at the beginning where they they documented the number of women in, at all the SOM firms and. Um, I would say the first, you know, was it the first five years, first six years, or, you know, it's like 40% women. And then at every level of leadership, it goes down. And, and, and right now, there's not a single partner that's female at SOM. Marilyn Taylor Jordan was the last one, and she's now dean at the University of Pennsylvania. And so I think that the problem is with, um, at least we see it in the research we do with, uh, with our foundation, is that you know, industry-wide in the bigger firms, there's a, real, there's a real vacuum at the top leadership. In one of our programs, the Industry Leaders Roundtable, it's specifically designed to focus on getting women in the top leadership because we do believe that the structure that Cynthia was referring to of firm structure um, <coughs> does need to be shaken up and women do need to be part of that dialogue for exactly the reasons we were talking about, for the different perspectives. And just imagine how a firm of say, you know, 500 to 1,000 um, would be different if there was equal male-female leadership at the top. So I'm not answering specifically your question, but I, I do think that it's just access. And that um, it's no wonder that, and especially in the 20s or 30s, that, that women own, you know, worked in their own, uh, well, I don't think many big firms would, would take on a woman and, and advance her to, to partner. It, it, certainly in the time of the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I'd like to think that 
that that's maybe changing, but I think you're right, at least in the historical examples, you, you left a firm or you were in a firm and you decided you wanted to do something different, there was some reason, some driver behind that, and you got together with people that felt the same way. So if the issue was a, a lack of advancement or the issue was we're going to leave Wright Studio and we're going to go out on our own and we're going to face the same kind of challenges, we might as well face them together. You know, and the other thing about partner, you know, that the, the top leadership is that you got to be a rainmaker in order to be the principal partner, right? You have to bring in the clients and bring in the projects. And this is another sort of wacky thing. I'm sorry, I can say this, I'm not an architect. But, you know, strange thing about just the structure of firms is if you're working 12 hours a day, when are you going to go out and meet the clients? You're, you're kind of a slave to the to the to the project, but you're you're not. You know, you should be out at five or six and be going to the you know to the Detroit Arts Institute, or you should be going to the Rotary Club or to the Hawks, you know, whatever. You should be meeting and greeting you know the the, the public and 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 cultivating relationships that will translate into into clients. I think you just touched on what those of us that love it call the magic of architecture. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am a big fan of small firms, so uh, I, I, I am non-corporate small firms mm -hmm. who can work, because it doesn't take that many people to design a relatively large building. I'm not talking mega Dubai buildings. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm really talking about, uh, or hospitals probably, but I, I am talking about high-rise buildings, I'm talking about significant institutional work. It doesn't take too many people. You can get too many people on a team. So I, I think that <coughs> smaller firms uh, with uh, uh, representation all across the boards are, uh, I, I personally feel that they're, they're very important and, and uh, probably, probably the most humane places to be and also produce the most humane work. And I think, uh, you know, architecture <coughs> represents culture. Architects have to be human beings uh, and have to participate in, uh, in life. Uh, so I think the 12-hour days and all the juggling of families <coughs> and so on, you have to have both. You know, you mm -hmm. have to work both. And a small firm will let you do that. Um, question over here? Yeah, um, <coughs> in the video, one of the ladies who um, graduated from Taliesin said she had the experience at Taliesin to work with concrete and like learn how to do those things. Um, like looking at how women, when they get farther up in firms, but it, um, there's also a disparity of women in the construction fields and construction okay. workers, contractors, engineers. Are there ways that you think we can help break ground in those industries and then perhaps that would help us further in the field of architecture? Yeah, I think that, that, all, that has to do also with, um, with the clients. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I know that uh, there are institutions, and certainly um, governmental institutions, are uh, required by law in some cases to have uh, women-owned uh, 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 firms. <coughs> Sometimes it's a uh, the women are there as figureheads, and that their firm is really run by men. But, but um, I think that that's part of the responsibility of clients, and really responsible clients to do that as well. And there are some some nonprofits and organizations that are that there's the professional women in construction. There's a New York chapter. There's a, a DC chapter. I don't know if there's a Detroit or Chicago chapter. Um, also in New York, it's new. It's a non-traditional employment for women, and it's getting them into the trades, the building trades specifically. Uh, but you 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 put your finger right on a very big problem that architecture is far better represented by females than a construction is dismal. Engineering is, is maybe 9%, 10%, you know, it's, it, it, it suffers the same um, dismal numbers, at least in, in terms of, um, uh, yeah, it, it just uh, engineering is another, another uh, you know, civil and structural engineering is another area that is, needs to have more <coughs> representation. I've been in a couple situations now where I've been um, interviewed by contractors. And I could say like the um, the difference being interviewed by an architect versus a contractor, I could feel kind of the... Vibe. Yes. <laughs> very different. Right. Just to follow up on that, we have a really vital organization in the Detroit area. And it's in many other uh, uh, areas in the country. It's called Commercial Real Estate Women. It's a oh, cool. network of more 
organization, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're here. So uh, any woman that wants to be involved, and it's a great organization because it has uh, professions from across the board, from women that are uh, selling real estate, who are project managers, who are selling furniture, who are architects. So that's really great. And I want to just ask a question, and you may know, uh, there were 100 women working for Wright as fellows. How many men? Ooh, that's a good question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I sort of want to say because um, if you caught, listen carefully, the, those first years, it was like 20 to 25 percent of the class were women. So I just, I, I wanted to say that, you know, there are about 100 out of maybe 1,000 to 1,200. I mean, I, I, but that's a very good question. I, I apologize, I can't, I can't pinpoint it. But um, you should also know that the women that were considered of this 100, they were also design and, um, you know, not, not necessarily, uh, did not pursue necessarily the architectural careers of the, of the women that you, um, that were highlighted in the film. But thank you, that was a good, very good question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, I can answer your question to today, Frank. About a year ago, I think it was AIA Detroit, or not AIA Detroit, they were releasing Architect Barbie, and it was 100 years of architecture and all this. And his staff there said, oh my gosh. <laughs> Some really, really good questions. <laughs> <laughs>